Taking the order of service, let us read in unison Psalm 100. Sing together, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. The Lord made us. We belong to God. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord. Bless God's name. For the Lord is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God's faithfulness to all generations. The first hymn of Easter, 243 verses 1, 2, and 4 of Jesus Christ is risen today, 243. Pray be seated. I invite you now to join with me in offering the prayer in unison that is printed for us in the middle of the first page. We speak together saying, Loving God, we look in awe at the mystery of the resurrection of our Master and friend. We rejoice that the raising of Jesus gives us new life both now and in the future, and also gives us the joy and comfort of his gracious presence. Glory be to you for your love, which is more powerful than all the forces of evil in the world. Praise be to you for your peace, which rests on us in sunshine and in rain. O God, who desires love and obedience from us, we admit that some of our attitudes, words, and deeds go against the way of Jesus. Passover lamb, who takes away the sins of the world, mend what is broken, heal any wounded relationships that separate us from you and from one another. 
Forgive what we have been and grant us grace to grow more and more into your likeness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. Paul wrote, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Let those words be for us this day, an assurance of the abundant grace of God extended to us, grace that gives to us the gift of peace. And so I say to you, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In whatever way you find comfortable, comfortable, I invite you now to pass the peace, the peace that we love so much and the peace by which we seek to live. Please greet one another. Peace to you all. Peace to you, Ken. We welcome those who are gathered for worship on Easter Day, our second service today. We had one this morning at 7, and you couldn't have planned it any better. The moon was still shining a little bit, full moon, and the sun came over the, the, the hill at the golf course just as we were lifting the cup and passing the bread. How likely is it that you can do that very many years in our climate? In any case, welcome to those who have joined with us on YouTube and to all who are here today. I know we have visitors from several communities today, including from Victoria in British Columbia and places in between. We wish all of you well on this day, this celebration of Easter 2024. Let us now join together in singing hymn number 247. This hymn, we will sing verses 1 and 2 only of hymn 247, and perhaps we will remain seated for the singing of these two verses. We move now to the readings for 
Easter day, I invite you to take the psalm book and the pew racks, and we will read verses 1 and 2 and verses 14 to 24. Some of these verses are the same that were used on Palm Sunday. Verses 1 and 2, and then moving to 14 to 24. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Turning the page, the Lord is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our next reading is from the Old Testament, from the prophecy of Isaiah, from the first of the three sections in that teaching, a section that is often associated with Easter in as much as it helps to inform us helps us to understand some of the wonders, beauties, and glories of the Easter celebration. A reading from the book of Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We move now to the New Testament, to the book of Acts. Throughout the period of Easter, the 50 Days of Easter, we hear readings in church from the book of Acts, sections that give witness to the power, joy, and wonder of the resurrection. A reading from the book of Acts. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. 
All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The gospel reading for this Sunday, for this Easter celebration, is John's way of introducing the story of the resurrection of Jesus. Quite different with respect to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John takes, as is often the case, a different approach, bringing forth a story that I think we love very much. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. She ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They've taken our Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she said this, she turned and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned, and in Hebrew, in Hebrew said, Rabuni. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the, and announced this to the disciples. I have seen the Lord. And she told them what, that he had said these things to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us join together now in singing the hymn at the dawning of salvation, number 248, 248. is raised 
Let me begin by presenting to all of us some of the symbols of Easter, some of the ways by which we think of Easter. In terms of the dawn itself, said one early church leader, Christianity is a religion of the dawn. My favorite image or way of thinking of the resurrection is in terms of the phoenix. The phoenix rising up out of the ashes, surely a rich, nourishing image, captured by one of our churches in Western Canada. When you enter the main door of that church, the first thing that you see is the image of the phoenix rising out of the ashes. Or the bulb placed in the earth, a symbol of dying and the giving birth to a new plant. The egg, with which we're familiar, out of which hatches a new chick. And of course, we do not forget the empty cross, nor the banner above the choir, the butterfly emerging, something quite different after a time in a cocoon. In some communities, white birds are released on Easter morning. Nourishing and refreshing ways to think of Easter. I like the words of C.S. Lewis who wrote, the best is what we understand the least. What a tender, delightful, delicious, touching story we just heard from the Gospel of John. Mary, lingering in the garden after her discovery of the absence of the body of Jesus from the tomb in Joseph's garden. She wept as she lingered. Would not anyone weep after that first holy week? Deep in the garden of Gethsemane, betrayal by a trusted friend for money, trumped up charges that were laid, denial by a leader in that little band of disciples, political intrigue and deceit among political powers, something we would not understand. Pilate, only able, it appears, to choose to do what was best for him. He took, no surprise, the expedient choice. And then there was death by crucifixion. Soldiers mocking a suffering victim. And now, after all of that, the body of the crucified one missing from the tomb. No wonder Mary lingered in deep confusion with her sense of loss, her longing for things to have been much different. She lingered, feeling sad, helpless, confused, dismayed, despondent. And we know Mary, because often, because often we have walked in her shoes, feeling within ourselves deep sorrow, a sense of loss, helplessness, dismay, despair, disbelief, feeling confused, angered, ready to shout out as King David did when his son Absalom was killed, oh, my son Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom. We've been there with Mary. We linger and we weep. We know all the feelings that Mary had in several occasions in our lives. We mourn our own poor choices and failures. We mourn any time when we have been mean-spirited. We pour out our tears in the face of human injustice and tragedy. We feel the pain of those with little food, poor water quality, inadequate housing, torn, worn-out clothing. And we know the pain and anguish of the piercing loss of family members and friends, persons for whom we had a great love and respect, 
persons who had significant influence upon us, persons with whom we enjoyed warm, caring fellowship. We do know Mary. We know her feelings of being pierced by loss. We know her deep sorrow. And, though therefore, we know what it is to linger and to ponder, to consider and reflect. But look what happened in her lingering. She had a moment of very rich, delightful discovery. She was taken aback. She was surprised by joy. The meeting of the very one that she had mourned. Jesus was now transformed. She recognized him when he called her by her name. The same Jesus, but resurrected, raised to new life, displaying the same compassion, warmth, understanding, and tenderness. Those things that were so much a part of who he was as he walked in Galilee and Judea. Mary was so moved by this discovery that she rushed, hurried to tell the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. This, you could say, was her confession of faith. That's at the center of our worship and our meal today at the Lord's table. Our worship today and our meal at the Lord's table point to three features of the transformation offered by the resurrection of Jesus. First, the new changed life that is made possible by the spirit of this loving, risen Jesus. The same kind of transformation that we saw in a person like Zacchaeus, who after he had lunch with this Jesus, became honest, generous, gracious. Much different compared to what he had been as a greedy, dishonest tax collector. A 180 degree turn. My favorite example of resurrection in the scriptures is surely that of Joseph, that difficult teenager who, as time went on and as a result of many experiences, found himself ending up as the premier, if you like, or the prime minister under the pharaoh in Egypt. What a radical change took place in his life as a consequence of the hand of God working within him and his adverse circumstances. Or there's the young Augustine, who after prayer and much thought made the big switch, going to the faith of his mother and becoming such an influential leader in the church many centuries ago. The power of the resurrection is always there, nudging us to move in the direction of that new life displayed by Jesus in both his teaching as well as in his resurrection. Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus points to this new mysterious life that is promised to us in other rooms of the Father's house when our flesh weakens and dies. Beyond description, filled with wonder, a new transformed life is promised, spoken to us often by St. Paul in his teachings. And third and finally, the meal on the table today points to the abiding companionship that we enjoy in our journey toward new abundant life on each day of our earthly journey. So therefore, let our worship on this Easter day let our eating and drinking at the table of our Lord set before us a panorama, if you like, of the ministry of Jesus. And especially this day, proclaim the risen Lord who enables each one of us to be transformed from whatever we are to what God intends us to be. The God who has precious new life for each person gathered in this building. In the future, and who for us is a constant friend and a refreshing companion. 
I had a greeting a couple of days ago from a retired minister in Montreal with whom I was corresponding. And at the end of his correspondence, he wrote, I wish for you the joy and hope of this Easter joy. We all need lots of both. Joy and hope, gifts to us on Easter. Thanks be to God. One of the things that is so associated with life in the early church and continues to be as time goes along is that of baptism or the renewal of baptismal vows. We will come to that in a moment. In the meantime, I ask you to take the insert in the bulletin and we will offer it, the last in a series from Presbyterian World Service and Development. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. The stone has been rolled back. The tomb was empty. The angel told the faithful women, he's been raised. He is not here. And so we have hope, a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. May the God of hope go with us to the grave. I now invite Michael Barkhouse, Livia Barkhouse, and Jessica Murray to come to the front of the church. Baptized persons in the faith of Christ who come this day to affirm the baptism that was made. Sometimes this is called confirmation, a fine term, but I prefer the term affirmation of faith. To all gathered this day, these persons have been baptized and by their baptism are members of the body of Christ. They've been nurtured within the Christian community and instructed in the belief and practice of the church. In making public profession of their faith, they desire now to affirm their baptism and to claim the rights and responsibilities associated with membership in the congregation of St. Andrews. Remember your baptism, I say to you and to the whole congregation, and give thanks. By the waters of baptism and the power of the Holy Spirit, God claims us and calls each one of us by name. God unites us to Christ in his dying and rising, and God grafts us, I like that term, he grafts us into the body of Christ as members of the church. God washes us clean by forgiving our sin. God commissions us to be a royal priesthood with Christ in Christ's ministry to the world. God empowers us to live in newness of life as people of the word, always inviting us to be renewed at the Lord's table until we feast with God in glory. By grace you have been saved through faith. It's not your own doing, says the scripture. It is a gift of God. You folks stand before God and this company of God's people to affirm the covenant God made with you at your baptism, to acknowledge your growing in grace over the years, and to assume responsibility as a disciple of Jesus in the congregation and in the world. Are you then ready to make public profession of your faith? Say, I do. Okay. Do you turn to Jesus Christ, accepting Christ as Lord and Savior, trusting his, in his grace and love? If so, answer, I do. I do. And do you desire, always in dependence on the Holy Spirit, of course, to mature as a Christian person in the church, to seek the guidance of Christ as you listen for his word, to celebrate his death and life at the table that God provides, and to engage in God's mission to the world. If so, answer, I do. <clears throat> Let us pray.
Blessed are you, most gracious God, for you have given to us the gift of baptism. Through water and the Spirit, you have claimed us as your own, cleansing us from sin, giving us new life. You called us into your church to be your servants in the world in the name of Jesus. You promised to be present among us to direct and defend your people by the power of your Spirit. And now we give thanks for your faithfulness to us and to these, your sons and daughters, who come to renew with you the covenant of baptism. By the power of your Holy Spirit, continue in them the good work that you have begun, that each of them may willingly serve you in love and in joy, with courage and truth, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Holy God, defend these persons with your grace. <clears throat> your servant, Jessica, that she may daily increase in the gifts of the Spirit. Your servant, Livia, that she too may daily increase in the gifts of the Spirit. And your servant, Michael, that he too may daily increase in the gifts of the Spirit. Serving Jesus Christ both now and forever. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all of God's people replied together saying, Amen. I wish you well as you continue in your journey, a journey which, begun, which has begun many years ago the Holy Spirit continued to work within you. Go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to whatever is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. I would like the elders who are present today, if they could come and join with me in offering the right hand of fellowship as we sense, uh, pardon me, as we hear you affirming your baptism and becoming professing members of St. Andrews. You guys are fine. Let's say this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Change now. <laughs> what I say doesn't mean anything. Thank you very much. We move now to the celebration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, beginning with the presentation of ourselves in the offertory. Let me explain how that will proceed. <coughs> we will, our gifts will be gathered, and after Jake Barkhouse plays an offertory, we will all join in singing hymn number 13, after which we will say the creed from 539 and have the offertory prayer. So that all the explaining might take place now, our plan today is to provide serving by having you come forward in two rows to the front of the church, and here you will receive the bread, and we will have someone with gluten-free crackers 
and then to proceed to the wine. And for some, you will find a person holding a fruit juice. I believe it is cranberry. In any case, that is how we will proceed today. We're kind of plowing new turf a little bit. If we happen to run out of space in the trays, we will go to the method that we used before COVID, which is dipping the bread in the cup. We tried to plan as best we could with the somewhat limited number of glasses that we have. At the beginning of the serving period, another one of my grandsons, both grandsons are more capable at the keyboard than myself, will come and play briefly for us as the serving begins, following which we will hear some music from the organ. Our gifts will now be regathered. The hymn is number 13, Ye Gates Lift Up Your Heads. <clears throat>
Switching then to number 539 in the same book, we use this translation or version of the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Even as three individuals affirm before us today their baptism, so now all of us standing before you affirm our baptism, presenting to you our loyalty and our love, presenting to you our desire to work in order that all might come to know the love and joy that Christ offers to us, participating in the various ministries that we offer in our community and across the face of the world to promote justice and to bring about peace. Bestow your blessing on each person gathered here today. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Those of us in the chancel are busy today and we are inviting you to join with us in keeping busy as well. Let us turn now to 564. We will follow the pattern down to the word Amen and then we will switch to the other version of the Lord's Prayer found if we need it at 831. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our greatest joy to give you our thanks, eternal God, creator, ruler of the universe. At your word the earth at your word the earth was made, spun on its course among the planets. Your hand formed us from the dust of the earth, setting us among all your creatures to love and serve you. When we've been unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. Your love remained steadfast. When we were slaves in Egypt, you broke the bonds of our oppression, brought us through the sea to freedom, making covenant to be our God. By a pillar of fire, as it were, you led us through the desert, to a land flowing with milk and honey, setting before us the way of life. You spoke of love and justice in the prophets, and in the word made flesh you lived among us, displaying your glory. Christ died that we might live, and is risen to raise us to new life. Therefore we join our voices with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed indeed is Christ Jesus whom you sent to deliver us. He came with healing in his touch. He was wounded for our sins. 
He came with mercy in his voice, but was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power he broke free from the prison of the tomb. At his command the gates of hell were opened. The one who is dead now lives. The one who is who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation. The lamb upon the throne, the one ascended on high, is always with us as he promised. Remembering then all your merciful acts, we now take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you've given us in creation to celebrate with joy the salvation provided for us in Christ. Accept, we pray, this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, and grant that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen, saying, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit now upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Jesus our Lord, the one who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus on the night of betrayal took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took a cup from the table, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. My life poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. All of you drink of it, and whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of him. St. Paul taught the church, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the loving death of the risen Jesus till he come. Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us and grant to us your peace. Some of the elders have been invited to come and to assist with the distribution. I would ask them to come and receive their communion. The bread of life and the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. The blood of Christ. The bread of life, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Bread of life and the cup of salvation. Body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. The bread of life and the cup of salvation. find a place to put your glasses at the end of the serving area. Can you move down a little bit? Please come in two rows. Body of Christ. 
Christ given to you. The bread of life. The body of Christ given to you. The bread of life. Christ given to you. Body of Christ given to you. Thank you. 
is risen from the grave. Jesus is risen from the grave. Jesus is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Jesus was seen 
by Mary. Jesus was seen by Mary. Jesus was seen by Mary. Alleluia. Peter will soon be smiling. Peter will soon be smiling. Peter will soon be smiling. Alleluia. Thomas will stop his doubting. Thomas will stop his doubting. Thomas will stop his doubting. Alleluia. Jesus will meet his people. Jesus will meet his people. Jesus will meet his people. Jesus is here in bread and wine. Jesus is here in bread and wine. Jesus is here in bread and wine. Alleluia. Jesus will live forever. Jesus will live forever. Jesus will live forever. Alleluia. I invite you now to take the book of praise once again. And we will sing a hymn that I will confess is a favorite of mine, 423. We had to get special permission to use it at this service today because of our being on YouTube. Let us sing to God's praise, hymn number 423. <laughs>
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you now and forever. Sandy, I would ask you if you could come down in the front pew, and I'd ask Chris to join him, please. <clears throat> Greetings to all. My name is Cheryl Weeks, and I serve as the clerk of session. In February 2023, Sandy announced to St. Andrew's congregation his intention to retire as our minister on Easter Day, Easter Sunday, March 31st, 2024. At that time, the date seemed so far away, but here we are. Easter Sunday, March 31st. We are gathered with great warmth and gratitude to Mark Sandy's final service after 56 years of ministry at St. Andrews and to offer him our best wishes. In August 1968, Sandy was appointed by the Board of Missions of the Presbyterian Church in Canada to lead the congregations of St. Andrews, Muscadabit Harbor, and Iona churches. I can only imagine the nudgings from God one experiences when asked to lead one congregation. To lead three congregations is beyond my imagination. However, Sandy did so successfully. When Iona called its own minister in 1975, Sandy was called as the minister at St. Andrews and Muscadabit Harbor in June 1976. He served Muscadabit Harbor faithfully until 2011 when the congregation amalgamated with St. Andrews and eventually the Muscadabit Harbor Church was sold. When Sandy arrived in this area, he had recently graduated from Knox College in Toronto, been ordained at Knox Presbyterian Church in Stratford, Ontario, and had been newly married to his lovely bride, Chris. Upon his arrival, the story goes that when Sandy was greeted by the moderator of the Presbytery Halifax in Lunenburg, the late Reverend Dr. A.O. McLean said, you aren't who we wanted, but you'll have to do. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling that one of Dr. McLean's son is in the congregation today, so he can probably expand on that. <laughs> we all agree, Sandy, that you'll have to do is well surpassed. St. Andrew's congregation is the beneficiary of Sandy's God-given gifts for ministry and service. I would like to share some of those gifts with you today. I trust that the gifts I speak of will reflect why we at St. Andrews are better people because of those gifts. We give thanks for Sandy's gift of language, spoken and written, for his gift of leadership, his gift of teaching, and his gift of commitment and devotion to the people of St. Andrews. We give thanks for his gift of compassion, his willingness to go the extra mile, and his ability to, to relate to and minister to all persons. 
We give thanks for his gift of creative vision and imagination, his gift of listening, and his gift of remembering, whether it be a birthday, an anniversary, a wedding, or of a death, or some other occasion. We give thanks for his gift of friendship, for his gift of humor. I know that many of you have been the beneficiary of that gift. I know I have. We give thanks for his upholding our reformed tradition, while at the same time speaking to and appreciating the current culture. We give thanks for his passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for his gift of discerning gifts in others to help strengthen the body of Christ. May I also say, Sandy, on behalf of the session, we give thanks for your gift of always doing things decently and in order. The people of St. Andrews are deep, deeply grateful for your many gifts of ministry. Your ministry among us is second to none. May God continue to bless you abundantly in your retirement. And thank you from the bottom of our hearts. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to call upon our senior elder, Wade McDonald, to present Sandy with a gift from the congregation. Do we need help? The artist's name is Guillermo Ortiz. He works at Calvin Presbyterian Church in Toronto. Did you want to, or can I do Chris's piece first, or do you want to do it now? <laughs> he wants the, my own. Oh, <laughs> we have someone else to attend to. Sandy is fortunate to have a patient and caring spouse. <laughs> Chris is so kind, generous with her time and skills to this congregation, and always willing to do whatever needs to be done. One of the things that she has done faithfully over the past 56 years, is to fold bulletins. <laughs> Sandy arrives at their home on Saturday night with an armful of bulletins, and here they are, Chris. You fold them, please. So I did a little calculation. <laughs> if she folded bulletins for 50 Sundays a year, as well as for special occasions, weddings, funerals, I estimated that she would have folded 280,000 bulletins <laughs> in 56 years.
I think that deserves the top prize. <laughs> Chris, we do truly appreciate your contribution to our church life. And to show our deep appreciation, Isabel Young, one of our elders, will present a gift from the congregation. So, Isabel, you can come forward. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And after Sandy will speak to the congregation, we invite you to the fellowship time in the church hall. Sandy. Hall. I've seen the hall. We'll want to get there as quickly as we can, so I will be brief. I remember that first Sunday in August 25, I was petrified. August the 25th of 1968, and about 20 years later, a woman who was at that service, we were having conversations, she said, you know what, that first time you came, I wasn't sure I was coming back, because I thought, <laughs> <clears throat> that fellow seems to be full of himself, and I don't think I want. She said she changed her mind. Meanwhile, I was petrified and wondering, what would I do next after that first Sunday? So it's all how you look at things. Suffice it to say, I'm very grateful for these 56 Easter's that we've spent here at St. Andrews. I appreciate all the prayers and support and encouragement and the ways by which we've been able to work together to accomplish the ministry that Christ has given to us. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart and from my wife's heart, as I'm sure, and we will see you about. Perhaps one more thing, and that is, in case some of you can't see as well from where you're seated, this window is a rep window is a this picture here is a replica of the one on the farthest back on your left. 